you might know Carl Kosoki as a uh, longtime starting safety for the Vikings back in their glory days. You might know him as the guy's career was cut short by a motorcycle accident that left him paralyzed. But there's so much more to him, and I want to tell you that story. Welcome to the Lockdown Vikings podcast. <laughs> You are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, 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 everybody, to another episode of the Locked On Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, your pal, and the kid you copied off in math class. My name is Luke Braun. You can find me on Twitter at Luke Braun NFL. You can find the show on Twitter at Locked On Vikings. And thank you so much for making Locked On Vikings your first listen of the day, even here in the summer with nothing going on but OTAs. Um, so I want to talk about Carl Kosoki today. I feel like he's kind of one of the more underrated Glory Days Vikings. He played for 10 years. He played um, on all the way up through the 72 season before he got in the accident that most people know about. Um, he was on the 69 team. Um, you might know that name from the Hank Stram quote, one of those plucky quotes from the sideline of Super Bowl four, where he's talking about 65 toss power trap. And we got Kasoki running around like it's a Chinese fire drill. As with everybody, they're so much more than what they were on the field. And I really, full confession, I want to talk to you about this because I just finished his book and I found it really moving. Um, and I just think he's a guy that's worth discussing more than just a few of what are honestly the lowest moments of his, his career. So um, this is a book from the 1980s. I think he published it in 81. It has been around. It's got a stamp from the Lyle Community Library, and it's addressed to a Nelson family in the signature uh, inside the cover. I think that's appropriate that this has been around, that the pages are falling out, and that it has been used to its fullest because Carl Kosoki lived life so hard. <laughs> like He lived life to the fullest in every way that you could kind of sense that. I do want to talk about his on-field, I mean, a little bit, right? He was the safety opposite uh, Paul Krause when he got to Minnesota, but his journey there had a lot of twists and turns. Um, he originally was pretty committed to going to play football at Marquette, um, and he was sort of informally told that he was going to get a scholarship and he was going to be able to play there. And then at the last second, he got a call, and they told him, yeah, we sorry, we gave out the last scholarship to someone else, so you're going to have to find somewhere else to play. So he ends up playing... Uh, and walking on at the University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point, a uh, very small school, and there was a mix-up with his scholarship there. He had to give them money, or they were actually going to like make him move out of the dorm and leave. Um, but he essentially had won over the coach at UW Steven Point so hard that that coach went over and like twisted everybody's arm and pounded the table for the kid, and they let him play. And he turned out to be one of the better players um, that program had ever seen. But halfway through his time there, the entire football program at the University of Wisconsin, Stephen Point, Stevens Point, dissolved. Um, and so he had made enough of a name for himself that he had a few more offers from other schools around the Midwest. He chose Drake. And so that's where he ended up getting himself on the map a little bit more to at least get a shot in the NFL after he graduated, um, he didn't get drafted and he was an undrafted signee at training camp for the Detroit lions. And he describes his time on the lions as very unpleasant. He didn't like it. It was mean spirited and it was not the camaraderie that he would come to be so fond of with his time on the Vikings. And around this time, um, you know, the, the lions, it was very competitive and it was very every man for himself. Um, and he, he recounts one time where he like hit a guy too hard in practice because he was frustrated with the kind of cold shoulder he was getting from everybody as a rookie. And he hit somebody too hard in practice. And then they just beat the tar out of him for the rest of that practice. Like they tackled him back so hard or they hit him back so hard, like blocking him, although offensive linemen just beat him up. And he was like, this sucks. And he was so beat up from that. And then he had to go play in a preseason game, but he didn't play very well because he was so beat up that he got cut. He goes into 
the general manager's office where they're going to have the we're cutting you conversation. But instead of, hey, you know, good luck. Here's 20 bucks for a cab. Go ahead. He has somebody on the phone. He's like, hey, I got an old friend on the phone. Um, it's Norm Van Brocklin. And Norm Van Brocklin, who was head coach of the Vikings at the time, said, hey, yeah, no, we've, we've had our eyes on you for some time. If they're going to cut you, we'll take you. And then he turns into, he would make Pro Bowls and stuff. Like, just add that to the list of Lions misery things. I do not envy Lions fans. So he catches on, of course, with the Vikings, um, and he makes all sorts of friends. And a good portion of the book is just about, like, his shenanigans in training camp. Now, look, if you're a new Vikings fan, and training camp didn't used to be the way it is at TCO. And that's a fairly new development. They moved to TCO in 2018. But even the last few years of Mankato, it was a bit more of a publicity stunt kind of, or a, a bit more of a public thing. A bit, it was covered and it was... But before that, you would have journalists at training camp, but it was summer camp. And they would go to Mankato. It was the dorms. They would sit there. They would build camaraderie. But come on. You got a bunch of 20-somethings chock full of testosterone in the best shape of their lives, told to have lights out by 9.30. Nah. They went out and they partied and they would sneak out. They would find ways to skirt curfew. There's all sorts of funny little anecdotes and stories. Um, I do want to tell you some of them just because they're so fun. But if you can get your hands on this old, old, old book, I do highly recommend it. But really what I get from Kosolki is... He was one of a few people on those old uh, high-flying Vikings teams that was the life of every party. Like, Jim Marshall was like this, too. Um, and they had all sorts of really fun guys on there, like Bobby Bryant and Lonnie Warwick. Um, everybody had a good time. Joe Cap was there when he was there. Yeah, that dude partied a little bit. It's all so gloriously early 70s. It's just so, like, the vibe of the early 70s that I know, and I kind of only know the 70s as the time when my dad was in high school, and so he tells me about all, all his shenanigans. I won't get you in trouble, Dad, don't worry. But I think of it as this time where just, you know, the kids would just, like, run around and play, you know? And you, as long as you were home for dinner, you, there was, like, no supervision. <laughs> and, like, look, when I grew up, when I was a kid growing up, it was a later time. It was... Yeah, a little more security. You had to. Everybody had to know your whereabouts. And I think kids like these days, had, like, there's a lot more of that, right? But 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 back then, there are so many things that you just could not get away with. And it's this beautiful microcosm of unsupervised 1970s tomfoolery. And the stories are hilarious. I will tell you a couple of them. Um, but first, let me tell you about something we do have in the modern era, and that is the technology to take collagen protein and turn it into something that tastes like a candy bar. That is Built Bar. Built Bar is absolutely delicious, and it's low calorie, it's uh, low fat, low sugar, low carb, and it's chock full of protein. Nowadays, their thing is Built Puffs. That's what I've been talking to you about. You can still get all their original flavors. They're like chocolate caramel, chocolate orange, chocolate raspberry, mint brownie, um, all sorts of delicious stuff there. But their Built Puffs are like a marshmallowy kind. It's like they whipped more air into them or something. So it's light and fluffy and it doesn't weigh you down. And it's got enough uh, protein to totally be reasonable after a workout or as like a midnight snack or something you have in the morning to get you going. It's awesome, and it tastes like you're eating something you would get at Easter. It's so good. Brownie batter puff is the one that they're sh they're uh, hawking right now. If you missed out on the birthday cake puff, it happens. I get it. I feel you. Don't miss out on the brownie batter puff. Go to built.com right now. Enter promo code LOCKED15, whatever you buy there. That's L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5 for 15% off of your order. That's promo code LOCKED15 at built.com. Hey, thanks again for making Lockdown Vikings your first listen of the day every single day. Um, I want to tell you two of the anecdotes from this book about Carl Kosoki. Um, I don't want to spoil the whole thing in case you can find a copy yourself, but I will tell you two of the anecdotes. The first one is about Astro Frog. Astro Frog had me actually laughing, although I felt kind of bad. So one day in training camp, this was 1969, which seemed like the season where the camaraderie was like at its all time highest. Um, and I, I don't think it's a coincidence that that's the year they went to the Super Bowl. But one of the things that happened is in 1969 training camp, one day, Fred Cox, longtime kicker, walked in with a rocket that he had gotten at some rocket shop uh, in town. 
and they set it off and it was all really cool. And Dale Hackbart, who was probably Kosolke's closest friend on the team, they were like camp roomies and they played in the backfield, the defensive backfield next to each other, um, was so hyped on that, that he went out to the shop and he got his own. Um, but he didn't know how to regulate this and he put way too much of the fuel in it and it went like a mile down the road and they had to spend all day looking for it in the farm that it landed in. <laughs> um, and it was actually still intact, which is cool. So uh, over that whole camp, all of the Vikings people got into rockets and they all started building their own and launching them and all that stuff. And over that camp, all of these veterans were uh, like super into rockets all of a sudden. Like this was the, the 69 camp of rockets. And so Jim Marshall, Ed White, Mid, Mick Tinglehoff, and Milt Sundy, um, all those four guys decided they were going to build one together. And they built like a two-stage, really complicated rocket that was supposed to go up and then they had a little cockpit in it that was going to launch off and parachute to the ground. And they said, well, we need to get a little passenger for that. So they went out and they caught a frog and they named him Astro Frog and they put Astro Frog in the rocket. I, for the faint of heart, this doesn't go well for Astro Frog. Uh, they launched the rocket up, but they hadn't wired it properly. So instead of um, the like gas tanks falling off the way that they were supposed to when they were out of fuel, the rocket just turned around and just started accelerating directly into the ground. <laughs> he didn't stand a chance. Um, the, the rocketry fun was a great time, but an another great example, and the second story I'll tell you, is the time the entire team ga gaslit Jerry Burns. Um, Jerry Burns, OC at the time, this is before his time as a coach, was uh, trying to enforce their curfew. And a couple of players had snuck out to go to the bars when they weren't supposed to. And Jerry Burns came in saying, all right, where are these two guys? And all the players, in an unbelievable coordinated effort, sent Jerry Burns on a wild goose chase. And they messed with Jerry Burns all the time. Like this was, they would always be needling this dude. That one time the offensive players all decided they were gonna tip off all of the offensive play calls to the defense, specifically to prank Jerry Burns. And Jerry Burns would be like, man, it's like they know it's coming every time. What's wrong with what I'm doing? And they had him going on this for like a week, just going like, what is wrong with my plays? How can the defense figure this out every time? And it's because they had like third baseman signals coming from like Joe Cap and Gary Cuazzo. But anyways, this time it was... You know, they'd go up and, and say, hey, you know, anybody seen these two players? And they say, I think they were over in Jim Marshall's room. And then so Jerry Burns would have to go all the way down to Jim Marshall's room. And Jim Marshall would be like, oh, I think I saw him in the bathroom um, a, a little bit ago. Maybe go check there. So he'd go in the bathroom and he'd be like, well, I didn't find him in the bathroom. Oh, that's weird. I just saw him there. Like, no, they're home. And uh, did you check the cafeteria? Maybe they're over there. Or, um, you know, and then I saw and they just bounced Jerry Burns around for like an hour. They bounced him around from room to room going, I think I saw him there. I think I saw him there. Eventually, Jerry Burns gave up and then the guys ended up not actually getting uh, getting caught or knowing who it was. Although I do think eventually Jerry Burns figured out that they had missed curfew and they got punished appropriately. But it, an incredible coordinated effort to uh, cover for their teammates. These are the kinds of shenanigans that would happen at old Vikings training camp. And they would they were so close and tight-knit, and the pranks were always hilarious. Um, and he tells all sorts of stories about what a training camp was like with Norm Van Brocklin versus what it was like, how it changed when Bud Grant got there, how they would prank Bud Grant. And he kind of thinks that Bud Grant, even though he never reacted and he always seemed a little bit cranky about it, secretly liked it all. <laughs> um, and... You just get this sense of this like camaraderie. And this is where you kind of get a sense for who Carl Kosulke was. He was really the life of the party and he was always willing to have fun and have a good time. He was the biggest like yes and guy ever. Um, one time he was approached by a couple of fans who were like, hey, I've got, you know, a, a sick family member who would love to meet you. And he goes, okay, where? He's like, oh, hospital, you know, down the road this far. Okay, let's go. And they like just went like that day. Like he was that kind of guy where he, if you asked him for something, like he couldn't help himself. He would always, always, always say yes. That particular anecdote happened at an establishment called the Left Guard, which had celebrity people that would kind of come in. And Kosoki was one of them that would kind of come in. It was like a summer thing, I guess. Um, and he would just mingle with fans and like make it feel like you were in some like exclusive, exclusive place. 
And there he met uh, his friend Monty, who is the bartender. Um, and he and Monty were immediately, these two dudes were like brothers. Like they are such close, fr close friends and they hit it off pretty much immediately. Um, and there's a whole other list of stories and anecdotes and times they went out and got in trouble. Um, and this is the part that I think people are more familiar with. Monty was the other guy on the motorcycle when they got in the accident. The day of the accident, um, they had basically been on like a month long bender <laughs> and, uh, Monty felt bad because Carl Kosoki was supposed to go to training camp and it was like, well, we've been, you know, eating like crap and been drinking and we got to get you into shape. Let's do a run. So that morning they ran five miles and then they were going to go to the beach. And if you're unfamiliar with the details of the accident, um, basically they were stuck behind an 18 wheeler that was kicking up a bunch of like sand and stuff. So they wanted to pass it. They go up to pass it and they were coming up over a hill and at the top of that hill coming into view all too late was a perfectly stopped car driven by a 16 year old who didn't know any better trying to make a U-turn out of the fast lane. And they hit the car and Carl Kosoki goes flying. His helmet disintegrates. His wounds were so bad. It actually, the doctors thought he wasn't wearing a helmet. Um, he ragdolls all over and he ends up paralyzed uh, from the waist down for the rest of his life. After that, it, the, the story gets a little more emotional. Um, and I, I want to talk to you about kind of what I think I learned from this and why I, after reading this, I'm so much bigger of a Carl Kosoki fan than I really knew I could be. In the book, Kosoki, Carl Kosoki's friend Monty tells a lot of this next part of the story of um, Carl Kosoki being unconscious of them not really knowing if he was going to make it or not. And, um, his, his rehab and the immediate kind of, he's in critical condition. Is he going to make it being angry at the driver who caused the accident and just processing all of the emotion, not to mention he was pretty banged up as well. I think he broke both his arms. He had to be in a wheelchair himself for a while. It was a really, really gnarly crash. Um, and you really get a sense for just how much danger Carl Kazoki was in. Um, and if it weren't for the sheriff that we're driving down and the quick thinking of the paramedics and the doctors, really good chance he wasn't going to live. And there was a good chance he wasn't going to live all the way kind of up until um, they were able to stabilize him like a long time later. But really where I think it captures me is when you're talking about the rehab. A football player who loved life as much as Carl Kosoki did, who loved running around, who loved uh, driving motorcycles, who loved horsing around and wrestling and playing games and all these shenanigans at training camp and all this, losing the function in their legs, it was something that he couldn't accept. He was in total denial about it. Apparently, that's actually not an uncommon response where you kind of say, well, OK, you say I'll never walk again, but how? what if I walk again? And apparently that's something that can happen to trauma victims, like their brain just sees it that way. Um, and going through that period of denial and then the darkness afterwards is, I think, where you'll really learn what's important. Um, this was a very tough year for Carl Kosoki because on top of all this, he was going through a divorce. And it was in rehab where he met the woman that would be his wife for the rest of his life. Um, and the people that pulled him out of it. And I think maybe the most emotional part of the story was Carl Kosoki Day, which was a uh, middle of that 1973 season where the Vikings, it was a Super Bowl season. They were like 10 and one. And a bunch of players said, hey, we... Uh, realize that you've been in the hospital for a long time. Your medical bills are probably piling up. We're going to do something about it. And you can't say no. And he tries to argue, but of course they're not going to let him talk his way out of it. We're going to do a thing. We're going to raise a bunch of money for you. They ended up raising like a quarter million dollars that essentially pay him pay for, for his medical bills, which f in the seventies NFL players didn't make the kind of money that they make today. So that was like a huge thing that, that impacted him. And as you're reading and in that whole chapter, all he can talk about is how happy he is that the Vikings whipped the Bears 31 to 13 that day. 
<laughs> they did it at like halftime of a home game against the Bears. It was the, his first public appearance. Um, and the Vikings, I, it, it really seems like one of those moments where they, they're they going to win this one for Carl. And it's so emotional. Keep in mind, too, that was bookended by their only two regular season losses of the of the season in that, that 73 game. One against, I want to say, Atlanta. And then right after that, they played Cincinnati and they got shut out for the first time in Vikings history. Um, so this was sort of a slump of play. And then in the middle of it, you have this blowout. And that is, I think, just evidence of the way that Carl Kosolke affected people around him because so many people wanted to help him in return. And him rediscovering that love for life that he had was really, really hard. It got dark during those times, especially after he came home from the hospital. I mean, he talks about the hospital, about all the friends he made with patients. Like, this dude was just, like, all extrovert. But he also kind of talks about later how he realized that that was a lot of that was a front and it was all very shallow. And his, his life didn't have the depth that he really thought it had. And he was kind of only interested in fun, um, which, to be fair, it's, it all sounded really fun. Um, and it sounded like that dude really lived a lot of a lot of life to the fullest for the first 32 years of his life. When he first moved out of the hospital and back home, he was deeply depressed and he kind of talks about like you know when when you're somebody as active as Carl Kosoki suddenly you have to sit in a chair and you can't really do anything you got a lot of time alone with your thoughts and that's where the depression sets in and he drank and he threw a bunch of parties and he tried to kind of shut it all out and and smile over it you know and it was very clearly you know he wasn't dealing with these problems he was hiding from them and the nurse who would later become his wife, her name was Sue, um, was instrumental in helping him through that and in getting, getting him out of the house. Let's go for a drive. You know, let's go see the sun. Let's, um, you know, let's, let's get out and do something. And I think that's where you kind of learn about who somebody is, where he really cared about everybody he ever interacted with. And I think it was that care that pulls him out of it. And eventually, um, cause he's trying to, he and Sue are trying to get married, but for complicated religious reasons, uh, they can't and they, they can't annul in the eyes of Sue's church. They can't annul his previous marriage until, um, they take some steps with the church. And one of the things that, you know, needs to happen there is um, they need to basically become born again. And Carl Kosoki had most, he had been raised Lutheran. He went to a Catholic school, but he was never that religious. And he kind of talks about how, you know, I was living for the devil. And he talks very much like a born again Christian. Um, and, and this is where faith and spirituality becomes such a, an important part of his story. And he certainly wasn't the first and he certainly wasn't the last football player to have that or plenty of them on the Vikings too. Um, but that was where he kind of found that depth that he was looking for when he finally accepted Jesus into his heart and all that stuff. And here's the thing. I'm not a spirituality guy. I'm, I'm, I'm not a religious guy at all, but I, I revere it, I guess is the word that I, that I will use when people ask me that question. Um, and I think it's a really good, this is a good example. I have the utmost respect for the place that faith has in people's personal lives. It's very powerful and it defines everything that they do. And it's, it's such a big part of so many people that I, I have this reverence for it. Um, and, and for Kosolki, that's where he finally finds that depth that he was looking for. And he and Sue can finally get married and then they have a kid together. And, and he, this book was published in 1981. So it ends kind of there. Really the reason that I wanted to talk about this it was because I read the book and I liked it and I wanted to talk about it, deal with it. But <laughs> really what I took out of the book was how much a challenge can really show you who you really are. And until the last moment, right, um, Carl, Carl Kosolke was calling Vikings exhibition basketball games, which is the thing they did for a long time. He was doing meet and greets. He was 
Uh, he wrote a column analyzing Vikings games for a long time, and he kept all of his relationships and stuff, and he was always super into the fans and, and into meeting, meeting people. He really overcame that in, I, I think, a way that I don't think everybody would. I think on those 70s teams, there are a lot of people that really seem like truly special people, people that will like affect your life if you let them into it. And Carl Kosoki is definitely one of them. He passed away in 2008, but he lived 10 times as much life as a lot of us will. And as much as what he did on the field was interesting, I mean, I could sit here and tell you stories about how he was a famously sound tackler and, and you know, the coaches would use him as teach tape. And he gave uh, Greg Landry quarterback of the Detroit Lions the hardest hit he ever had in his career because he was still mad about getting cut by him I could tell you all those stories but I think what matters is really who he was and the effect he had on the people around him and I think that just deserves to be appreciated uh, I don't have a plan for tomorrow yet we'll see what it is I'll probably figure it out at the last minute like I always do um, I will see you all then in the meantime go check out the locked on sports today podcast which is covering all things around the wide world of sports. May is a pretty crazy month. You got two playoffs going on. You got WNBA. Um, so there's a lot to talk about, not to mention uh, insane reporter player spats in San Francisco 49ers OTAs. So hopefully they talk about that stuff too. I will talk to you all tomorrow. And as always, Skull.